Open your Bible with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. This series that, that I started a, a few weeks ago is likely to be interrupted over you know, the, the, the coming uh, couple of months because of, of travel. But uh, I, I want to encourage you to do something beginning tonight. When you go home, take out your Bible and um, start reading through the book of Acts. To me, it's one of the most exciting books in the Bible. Um, it's a story. It's your story. It's the story of the Holy Spirit working through people like you and me. And uh, in our discussion today with the, the, the pastors, and, uh, and, and Joel Rosenberg is not a pastor, but he's a, a very, very gifted teacher and writer, and you know him, he's, and he's been here. But um, with the, the, the pastors today, this, this, we were just talking about wrapping up the, the book of, of Acts with these pastors and their wives and the assistant pastors and Christian workers all over Israel and the West Bank. And um, somebody brought up the, the, the thought, the idea, and it's, it's been, oh my goodness, it's been preached, it's been hammered by so many that you can't go to the book of Acts for doctrine, that it's a narrative, and you don't get doctrine out of narratives, and I'm not sure that that's always true. I think there's plenty of just hard, strong truth in the book of Acts, but, but what you do find in, in the book of Acts, again, in our story in the book of Acts, is God doing a new thing, doing something that was brand new to the people of the nation of Israel. Um, and I want to read to you beginning in, in Isaiah chapter 43, just a verse or two. And we're going to jump around a couple of places. But starting at verse 16, I didn't put the whole passage up there, but starting at verse 16, says this, thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together, they shall not rise, they are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Read verse 19 out loud with me if you would. Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Father, we pray that this evening as we sit here with our Bibles open, our hearts open, Lord, in a, in a safe place with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. Stir our hearts and fill us, Father God, yes, with your spirit, but fill us with a confidence and an, and an expectancy, Lord, that we get to be more than spectators, watching other people do the work of the ministry, reach a broken world, tell someone about Jesus, reaching out in the power of your spirit. Lord, we don't want to be just spectators. We don't want to be in the stands. We don't want to be in the stadium, Lord. We want to be on the field about the work, confident in your spirit, confident in your calling, Lord, confident in the gifts that you've given us to use. And so, Father, we pray in Jesus' name tonight that you would stir us in that way and maybe help us to leave here with that readiness to just see what's next for each one of us that you would do a new thing in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. There are probably a half a, different, a, half a dozen different ways that you could go on this, this statement of God, of Yahweh, God himself speaking and saying, I'm going to do something new, and now it's going to begin to spring forth. Now it's coming. And was that specifically right there? about the unleashing of the gospel and the unleashing, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon brothers and sisters like you and me. I don't know if it was exactly that, but I'll tell you what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out 
upon God's people and a band of them. And before the day was over, how many were added, as it says, how many were added to the church that day? A couple dozen, maybe? Yeah, thousands and thousands, 3,000 added to the church. Uh, was it a round number? Did it round up? Oh, my goodness, 2,999? We've got 3,000. That was a rough number, most likely. It was a multitude of people who came to Jesus that day on the Temple Mount. And um, it was a remarkable thing. But God was doing a new thing at that point. And he said, get ready, get ready. What did, what did Jesus say when he was way north in Caesarea Philippi to his disciples? As he, he stood there pointing their attention down to that. I've talked about this recently. I've talked about it a lot through the years. Pointing their attention to that, that religious shopping mall there, or food court, as, I, as I've called it. And he was telling them in so many words, when I unleash you on this world, you've got to come to places like this and people like these. I say it every time we go to Israel. There's no Jewish mom or dad that would have a good day if they'd heard that their kids had been hanging out in Caesarea Philippi with all that religious nonsense and vulgarity. And, and just, it, was, it was hideous what was going on up there. But Jesus was saying, I'm sending you into a world that's full of this nonsense. And I'm going to equip you to do that. And he said, the gates, he said, I will build my church. I heard somebody recently say that, uh, in fact, we read it today in the, a book that we're going through with the staff, um, Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness. Jerry Cook was talking about the fact that Jesus didn't send out church planters. Now, that's kind of, you know, that was a shocking statement. He said he sent out disciples because Jesus said, I'll build my church. I will build my church. I will plant my church. Now, that's maybe an overstatement because God does send out pastors, establishes congregations, and something gets built. But Jesus said, I'll, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not, will, will not conquer them. The gates of hell will not prevail against them. And, and what was remarkable about that and the way that Jesus did it, and I think when you, when you turn to the book of Acts, I can almost hear Jesus in the background saying, from heaven or from within his people. All right, now let's get started with this. Now we're going to do this. Now I do a new thing. And now it will spring forth. And what was so different uh, about what, what happened on that day and continues to happen in the church when the church is at its best? What was so different between that model and the previous model in Judaism? I'll tell you one of the things that was different. The, the, the ministry was run under, under Judaism. The ministry was run with, the, with the, the tabernacle and then the temple and then synagogues started popping up and they were all over the place by the time Jesus was, was you know, on the scene. But, but those ministry centers were run by elite professionals. They were run by the priests the high priests, and then the rabbis who had been schooled to, you know, to, to shepherd the people. But what happened on the day of Pentecost is that the Spirit was poured out. You, you, know, you know the phrase? I will pour out my Spirit on your sons and your, and your daughters. I will pour out my spirit. And what happened on the, on the Temple Mount and spilled out into this, the streets and those narrow little streets in the neighborhoods of Jerusalem and made it, what Jesus said, start in Jerusalem and then Judea, or Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. He said, it's going to go everywhere. And he hands that ministry, he hands significant ministry through the power of his spirit and the gifts of the spirit, which we'll be talking about in the weeks and the months to come, he hands that authority to people just like you and me. You are not a second-class Christian. There are no second-class Christians, and God takes us very, very seriously. You see some of the most remarkable stories in the, in the book of Acts of uh, powerful things that, that happened through through guys that were they were just water boys. One of my favorite is who, who knows one of the water boys. 
There were two water boys, food boys. They, they, were, they were like bus boys. They were in charge of, of the table, making sure that the, the widows got enough food. Stephen, and then who else? There's another one. And Philip. I love Philip. I mean, Philip was this itinerant preacher. He just kept going where the Spirit said, now go this way, now go this way, now go that way. And now make it on up to Caesarea Maritime, where he settled down and he raised a family. And he didn't just have four daughters. He raised those four daughters. And he and his wife, Mrs. Philip, whoever she was, we don't even get her name. But, but they raised them to speak for Jesus. And they were prophets, prophetesses, and they spoke. So it's the, the women are in on this. Everyone is in on this because there's so much work to do. And God has a station right where he wants us. How many of you believe that? God has, yeah, I know, I know. Some of you would rather be someplace else, a different zip code, and a different state, a different country, whatever. But, but if you know that you're where God wants you to be, you, you've got to, to live this life in such a way that you're on call day in and day out. And God says, I've got something for you to do. So he says, I'm going to do a new thing. It is, it is moving from the formality to the dynamic. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, you know, having a format, but you can get too formal and, and, and kind of the Holy Spirit, there's kind of no, there, there, there's no room for anything new. There's no room for a new assignment to maybe, maybe head over that way today. Maybe take a different route. You know, I, be, I believe the Holy Spirit will sometimes nudge us in ways that he doesn't even care whether or not we know that he did it. You, you ever just get a hunch? I think I'm going to go a different route to work. How many of you have ever just, you, you've run a rut into the, the roads that you always go. You can go there, you can go there blindfolded, right? And yet when we moved into the house that we're in now about, gosh, I think it's 12 years ago. Uh, we moved in there. I, I blew right past our, dry, our, our, our street coming off of, uh, of Heil down here probably seven or eight times and had to turn around in a church parking lot to get back to my house. But now I can do it blindfolded. I don't. Some people think I drive blindfolded, but I don't drive blindfolded. But if you've ever had one of those moments, you just get this kind of itch to go left instead of right. And you don't know why. And, and to go for lunch to this place, you've never gone to that place before. But if you get that itch, pay attention. Pay attention to who knew or maybe somebody you already know that's been on your mind and bam, they show up right there. And I love the way that God does that. He's doing a new thing, and it was moving from this, this hierarchical ministry that was run by the elite uh, priest class and the professionals to the unleashing of this community of the equipped and empowered and commissioned operatives of the kingdom, radical in their love for Jesus and zealous for him, and just ready to, to open a conversation that just might turn into a life-changing encounter for the, for the person that you touch as well as you yourself. This, the church that Jesus established was a new thing. It was coming outside the walls, whether it was the walls of the synagogue or the walls of the temple. It was, it was time to, to just, and, and that's exactly what happened, right? The, the veil in the tabernacle was ripped from top to bottom, not so that you could get in to hang out with God, but because God was invading. He was invading life after life, heart after heart, so he could invade the world through people like you and I. And, and, and I, I just love this. As, as God is establishing, even in these days, I believe a new thing in his church. It's like, it always comes back to this. I think in revival, it always comes right back to the church outside the building and present in the streets and on the beach and in the marketplace and in the workplace and at the, at the softball field and wherever people are. Oh, if God can just get us to pack up our faith and the truth that we know. If he could ever just get, if he could get all of us motivated and, and moving into the world where he's planted us, whoosh, the impact. And I believe that it's happening. Even in these days, I believe that it's happening. Um, the Proverbs chapter 16 passage, you know that one. In fact, let's turn over to that and we'll run through these. In, you know, I know this is going to sound extremely random tonight, but in no specific order. 
although it's probably going to be the order that it is up on the screen. And I'm not blaming jet lag on this. I just got over jet lag in time to go get some more tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon. Um, I, hope I, I hope I put this down right. Verse, yeah, did I? A man's heart, yeah, verse 9. A man's heart, read this with me. A man's heart, by the way, pause, a woman's heart too. And a boy's and girl's heart too. A man's heart, what? Plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. Will you and I let God do that for the rest of the day? We, we, we've got some time left, right? I mean, it's only 722 right now. And I'm not talking time left in the service, but we've got time. Some of you are going to go shopping. before You've got to pick up something on the way home. But w- will we let the Lord do that? Will we plan our ways and say, God, that, that's tentative. This is what I see, but I'll hold that tentative, and I'll let you direct my steps. And I'll let you bring just the, the, the right thoughts to my mind and the people in my path. But the, a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And, and we're going to get into this. And I, can't, I can't wait for the passages when we come down to the, the walk in the Spirit and the life in the Spirit and the following of the Spirit. It, it, the thing is, some of you are going to be frustrated because you're going to want it to be so meticulously, technically you know, laid out. And it's just, for me, it's just never been that way, ever. But the Lord is ready to direct the steps of his people. He wants to direct our steps. He wants to take us to new places. He wants to do new things in us. And Zechariah, keep turning to the, to the right in your Bible now, past the major prophets, and uh, move over to the minor prophets and make your way to Zechariah. How would you feel if you were a prophet and somebody said, you're just a minor prophet? These minor prophets had amazing impact, didn't they? Zechariah, chapter 4. I'm going to read down to the the verse 6. We'll start at 1. The angel who talked with me, Zechariah says, came back and awakened me as a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? He said, I'm looking. So I said, I'm looking, and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to seven lamps. And two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. And so I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No. He said, I don't get it. You know, and, and if the angel wasn't there to help him, I don't, what, what, what would he have done with the vision? I mean, if I was him, I probably would have planted a couple olive trees in my backyard, but that wasn't the point here. He said, thus says the Lord. He, says, he said, not so, Lord. And so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How many, how many of us have heard that applied bunch of different ways, you know, through our walk with the Lord. That is a transferable principle that I need to cling to, hang on, and live by for the rest of my life. When I get my, you ready for this? You get them too. When I get my big ideas. Do you get big ideas? Do you get, you you ever go home and say, oh, honey, I got a great idea. I I know, I know you really wanted to, to, to expand the master bedroom, but I want to, I want to put in a jacuzzi instead. And you got this big idea. And you know, I don't know how your big ideas turn out, but when, my, when, when I'm talking about big ideas that have to do with touching the world for Jesus, big ideas that have to do with reaching a person, a certain person, reaching out to, might be reaching out to certain um, politicians with a little bit of a truth download. And you get an idea, maybe God will bless this. I, I remember when the idea came, and it wasn't unique to us, certainly, but the idea came to, to possibly go on the radio. With uh, when it wasn't called Refuge Radio at that time. Anybody remember what our radio program was called to begin with? Anybody remember it? It was Coast to Coast. It was Coast to Coast because we were on the um, 
Calvary Satellite Network, which was all over the country at that point. But then when it came time to, um, I mean, not came time to, but then when we'd been on there for, I don't know, probably eight or nine years, shortly after we came, and, uh, and I got a call from uh, Pastor Chuck saying, would you like to go on a, a daily program, a Monday through Friday on, on K-Wave on, in the afternoon? And, and I'd been thinking about it. It had come to my mind. And I'd asked around a little bit to other guys that were, were doing that. Where that had, you know, they were on, they were on K Wave, and their churches were in the K Wave broadcast area, and just had a bunch of questions. But it was a big idea, and there was some talk about that big idea, and that one came to fruition. But how many of you have had big ideas that never got off the drawing board? Are you bitter about it? Please don't be bitter about it, because the mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord will direct his steps. But to be directed, what do you have to be doing? You got to be moving. You've got to be taking a step. And some of those steps have to do with, yes, dropping to your knees and stepping on, down onto your knees for a little bit and, and bringing that to the Lord. But it, it, the Holy Spirit wants to, 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 to direct me. There isn't any single one of us in this room that God says, I don't have any plans for you. I, don't, I got nothing for you. I just want you to keep showing up and, and just keep coming to church on Wednesday night and, and Sunday morning, you know, at the at the. 11 o'clock service. That's all I want you to do. Don't, God, doesn't have, God has more than that for every single one of us. And if, if you've lived this far as a Christian and have never said, God, what do you want me to do? It's time. It is time because I believe there is going to be a new thing that God does in these days. And whether it's going to be something that is, is written down as the last great revival before Jesus comes for his church. I've been saying this for probably a year or so, but I have a hunch that we are on the, on the last team on the field. We may just be the last team on the field. I'm not just talking about refuge. I mean, believers that are uh, around and alive and engaged today. I was talking to a, a pastor here in, uh, in Huntington Beach that uh, ran into the other day and uh, just over in the, in the marketplace here. And... Um, and I just, I, I say this to, to every pastor I know that, that I know is engaged in the work of the Lord. And brothers and sisters as well, not just to pastors. But I love, I really love to say this to, to pastors that are, are very local. Because I mean it with all of my heart. I don't, I don't have a sense of competition with any other church in our region, in our zip code within a mile of here. I, I just, I don't have a heart to compete with anybody else. And I love to look them in the eyes and grab their shoulder and say, I am so thankful that I get to serve Jesus in the same zip code as you in these days, that we get to work on the same team in different corners of his pasture. And if you know some Christians that are in, in you know, different fellowships and, and you, you have those kind of encounters, encourage those folks that, that you're thankful to be on the same team as them and see what God will do. I'll tell you what, it will encourage them. I know it'll encourage them, and it's encouraged me when people said that kind of thing to me as well. Well, I want to look at one more passage in Acts chapter 4, and you see it up there. Acts chapter 4. This is close to the beginning, after the Spirit was poured out. And apostles are just, they're, they're not ready to leave Jerusalem. Although Jesus had said, get out of town. He said, get busy here, get busy in Judea, which we would call like the county, the region. They said, now get up, go north to the Samaritans that, that, that none of you liked before, but they watched him reaching out to Samaritans. So he says, I want you to move, move, move. Now, the, the, the apostles really stayed put in Jerusalem for a long, long time. Some of them finally began to move out. But this one day, a couple of them head off to the, to the, uh, to the temple. And um, let me see where we'll start. Verse, I, I've got Acts chapter 4, um, verse 3. Three, I think. Okay, I want, but I want to go earlier. Um, let's look at verse 1. As they spoke to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. 
Okay, now, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me let me back up even a little bit further. The you know, there's been preaching going on, and, uh, and Peter has had amazing success in the uh, in the preaching of the gospel. Probably nobody more surprised than Peter, who thought he was off the team for a while. But um, so uh, we'll just allude to it, or not allude to it, just refer to what happened in chapter three with Peter's preaching and people come to Christ. But so here they are. They speak to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. The church is still just exploding. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, the elders, and the scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, we've heard them before in the Gospels, John and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. You know who, who he's talking to? The elite. They're in charge. They're in charge of the temple. They're running the religion. They're, they're, and, and they're busting people who don't get it right. They're calling people to account who aren't doing it their way. And these guys are not doing it their way because Jesus told them to get out and preach it. And they did. And when they it said, by what power or by what name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, referring to the crippled at the temple. He said, are we in trouble for that? That that poor, pitiful beggar now has his legs back and he's strong? If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well? Well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel. <laughs> What's he saying there? We're just getting started. We're ready to tell not just the people of Jerusalem, but we're just getting started here. Let it be known to everyone in Israel that by the name of, say it with me, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. And Peter, man, Peter. What got a hold of Peter? He's not saying anything dumb here anymore. He's, he's just preaching the, the truth. And he says this, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has, been, which has become the chief cornerstone. And nor, nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And then he went, huh. No, he didn't. But I might have been tempted to. But wow, where did he get this? Spirit of God was upon him and loosed the tongue of the fishermen. And I, I'm, I am convinced that there's times where Peter walks away from those encounters. He's saying, man, where did that come from? He knew where it came from. There's an utterance that was prepared in his heart by the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, for the life of me, I can't figure out when Peter had time to study, because that's how all preachers prepare. You study, you read this book, you read that book, you read lots of the Bible, and, and you think and you compare this passage with that passage. But, but tongue, the, the, the tongue of Peter had been loosed. The spirit of Peter had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, I think he said, I don't know how much time I've, I have to, to get to these guys, but they need to know that there is one name under heaven. One name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And they better not miss it because without it, there's no salvation. He said, if you want to know who made the lame man walk, it's Jesus. The same Jesus that you crucified, but that's okay because he's alive again. And having suffered for your sins, he's alive again. And by him, this man stand whole, stands here whole. And that's the stone which you rejected that's become the thing the chief cornerstone, and there's no other way to heaven.
There is no salvation in any other name except in the name of Jesus. Now look at this, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. There's probably some loose, Lucy, uh, can I say Lucy goosey? There's probably some really loose paraphrase that almost makes it sounds like the, these guys are just dummies, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying, we didn't train them. They weren't, they weren't trained by us. They didn't go through our seminaries. They didn't graduate with, you know, with the sheepskin in, in, in theology. They're untrained, uneducated men. And Peter could have said, yeah, fisherman. And, and, and he's a tax collector. And that guy over there, he, he could point out what they all were. He said, when they realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Gosh, I hope, I hope it can become obvious with us that people will say, man, they really are Jesus' people. They take Jesus seriously. They've been hanging out with him. Have we been hanging out with Jesus? Have we been spending time with him? Yes, in, in, in our Bibles, but yes, in prayer and, and open to whatever he wants to do through us. And, and see, in verse 14 says, and here's the man. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they couldn't say anything against it. They'd seen the guy for years, most likely. And there's the proof. The man is standing whole before them. Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go outside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. You know what's inferred there? We wish we could. We wish there wasn't this evidence. We wish that this, this was just what? An issue of words. But it wasn't just words. It was the works that were empowered and inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I don't know what it felt like to Peter and John when they walked to the temple that day and told the man, we've got no money for you. We are broke. Don't have any silver, don't have any gold, but we'll give you what we have in Jesus' name. Rise up and walk. And if only that hadn't happened, they could have dismissed it as just some crazy religion but said, we cannot deny this. Now look at verse 17. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let's severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. Did that work? Obviously not. And so they called them, commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, I've just... I've just put a tweak on that, didn't I, in the way that I said it. I, I, don't, I don't know the tone of voice that they had when they spoke back to the men. Maybe there, maybe there were tears in their eyes. It seems to be a thing happening among us here tonight. Maybe there were tears in their eyes when they saw the hardness of the heart of these, these religious leaders. They said, it's right before you, brothers, and you're still going to fight it. I don't know that they were getting all, you know, gnarly with them. But they said, we, we can't stop. How can we stop talking about Jesus who rose from the dead and opens blinded eyes? You judge. We can't stop speaking about the things we've seen. And so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what he had done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle, uh, th this miracle of healing had been performed. And so, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported, to all that the chief, uh, reported all that the chief priests and elders had said. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, please help us to be more careful next time said, no, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, 
who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage, Psalm 2, and the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. And then on. And we could go on and on and on. And the story does. And so I encourage you, read your story this week and the next week, okay? And when I come back, I wanna, I wanna dig in more into what this, this new thing is that God wants to do in us and through us. Uh, and, and, and these guys really were saying, this is just the beginning. I mean, we're, we're, we're only in chapter one or two of this new thing called the church, full of the Holy Spirit, moving into the world where Jesus', is, Jesus people were. And, and, and it's interesting that they didn't walk away from still going up to pray at the temple. Why? Well, there were people there. There were people they wanted to reach. And when you'd get up to the Temple Mount, and if, we, uh, if any of you go with us, we almost always go up to the Temple Mount unless it's been closed down. And, um, and, and you, you, you would see in, in the area that's called the, the, the Court of the Gentiles, Solomon's Porch, all kinds of conversations, all kinds of business going on. You'd go out there and you would hang out. We know from, the, from other stories about the, in, in the gospel where there were old folks that just, the, the one woman that just stayed up there. Anna was up there. She lived up there. And so life was conducted. And why would they keep going back? Because seekers were there. And why would they go off in other directions? Because God sent them to seek lost people, just like he was. So I, I think the thing that excited me the most today when I was talking with my friends about the conferences that are coming up in November over in Israel, as we're doing a, sort of an overview of the chapters we've been through and then hitting the final four chapters of, of the book of Acts, that just what really struck me is the overview of the story that we find in the book of Acts is God doing a new thing that he is still doing. And he's moving you and I into places of encounter where there's people that are broken and people that are hopeless that are looking for hope. And we get to be somewhat the answer to that brokenness. The book of Acts is the record of God doing a new thing. And God's saying, now watch this. Now it's going to spring forth. And may it spring forth in you and me. May we find ourselves more, um, more full of anticipation than ever before to get up in the morning and say, God, I'm ready for the day. I'm ready. I've got a plan. I've got a a calendar full of appointments, maybe. But if whatever you can squeeze in at any point, I'll be ready. If it's in the appointment or outside or it's at lunch and you nudge me this way, you nudge me that way, God, I want to go that way. I just want to live a life that matters. Amen? Where were we? It was someplace when we were in, when we were in Israel, on the, on the last tour. And there was some, oh man, I, I, I didn't think of this till just now. I would have uh, probably called and asked, but it was something about um, realizing that you're, oh, it was at the, at the bullet factory. That was a fascinating stop that we made down in the, the southern valleys where during the, uh, the occupation by the, by the British, the, and did I talk about this on a Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago? Good. Um, um, but th where the, the, the Jews that were coming back into the land, they were not a nation yet. The, World War II was over, but they had not become a nation. And under the British, they were allowed to have weapons, but they could not have ammunition unless you had permission to get the ammunition. And they realized that they were going to be fighting a war. Very likely, they'd be fighting a war for their their existence as a nation as there was rumblings of statehood. And so this, this group of young people, can I see the hands of anybody in here that's 20s or 30s? 20s or 30s? <laughs> I not wish you were, but it was, it was people of that age that got together and they formed a kibbutz, a co-op. And um, so they formed this kibbutz and uh, they were going to be farming all kinds of stuff and and, uh, but somebody said, you know, I've got a vision that we need to make some bullets. We need to produce some bullets. 
to fit these guns because we're going to be fighting for our life. And it turned out that in the, the battle for their independence, the close, I think they said three million, was it three, two million or three million bullets that they, I think two million bullets over a three year period that they did. And, um, and they had to do it in hiding. They, so they built this factory 28 feet underground. It took them 15 days to do it. Is that right? Was it 15 days? 21. 21 days to do it. And it was remarkable. And knowing that if they got caught, especially once they started making bullets, they could be executed. It was a, it was a, a crime punishable by death. And so they, they opened up a laundry over here. And, and the noise of the laundry muffled the noise of the machines that were down underground. And then on the other side, they, they did a bakery. And there were these two different ec exits and entrances into the bullet factory. And, and what really struck me is that those people knew that they were doing something that mattered. It really, really mattered. And David Ben-Gurion, who was the first uh, prime minister of Israel, um, when it, it, speaking about what was happening in that area, and so many people were doing all kinds of things covertly and all, but he said he knows of nothing, and I, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but he said he knew of, of nothing that was more remarkable, and this is paraphrasing what he said, that, uh, that, ad, that it was so important in the effort towards statehood, and he said this, I don't know which was more remarkable, I would say their chutzpah or their humility because they didn't come out sounding a horn about, look what we did. And most of the world never heard about it until about 15, 20 or, or, or so years ago. And when I heard that, about that group of young people doing something together that mattered, that it mattered for life and death, it mattered, I think, even in the prophetic scheme of God with the nation of Israel, but it mattered. I couldn't help but think about us. And what God has called us into, there are no new plans. Go everywhere, tell everyone their sins can be forgiven. Make disciples out of them. Send them out. We're involved in something that matters far beyond just our gatherings. This is a part of that in equipping the saints for the work of of the ministry. And um, I hope that excites some of you tonight, that you get to be involved in something that has eternal value and eternal impact. And don't minimize your part in it, even if you think, oh, it's just little old me. Yeah, it, it really is, Ross. It's making a difference. And so that's the new thing that Jesus did. He, he came out of, of the building and into the world dispatching you and I, and oh my goodness, how did we f turn this thing, how did we flip this thing around where so many get the idea that to be a Christian means you go to church on a Sunday. You attend a meeting and sing a few songs. We'll keep singing songs, won't we, Jess? Yeah, we're gonna keep singing songs and we're gonna keep gathering, but with this in mind, to invade the world that we live in and do something that makes a difference in this world. So, Father in heaven, I, I thank you for this gathering of your people tonight, Lord, and I just pray that there is a, oh, a stirring that comes from your spirit, Lord, that you could find us movable, easy to be moved by your spirit, learning to discern the voice of your spirit from the voice of our own mind, Lord, the voice of the world around us. And you would speak clearly to us, Father God give us hearts to surrender to you, to worship you in spirit and in truth, even if there's never another song coming out of our mouth, Lord, that we worship you with the surrender of our lives. Lord, I know you still have such a passion for this broken world, and everybody on all sides of the political aisles, living under all kinds of different isms, pushing all kinds of agendas, you love every single
stand there right now before we walk out the doors. Take a moment and, and just uh, in, the, in this in this moment, this could be a, a real significant moment for you, where you make a surrender, and maybe you're saying, God, I, I get it now. You want to use even the old me, and just make a surrender, say it to God, my life is yours. You purchased it with your blood. My life is yours. I'm ready. And if you know what He's called you to do, if you know the next. of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.